Thanks. So, so I'm going to I'm going to speak about uh, psilocybin meditation, mystical experiences, and therapeutic outcomes. But before I do that, um, I'm going to. I just have to acknowledge that uh, none of this would have been possible without the involvement of really uh, spectacular and incredible group of people with whom I have the privilege to work. Um, so everything you hear is a pro see here is a product of uh, team science and also funding from the Hefter Research Institute, the Council on Spiritual Practices, and the National Institutes of Health. Um, before I jump into real specifics and, and data, and, and sorry, we're jumping from small back up to the big, we're going to talk about mystical experiences, which are very far on the other dimension from microdosing. Um, uh, I want to I want to begin with this question, which is uh, the way I, I've I've began uh, preparing individuals who join research studies uh, with psychedelics, especially those who have never had an experience with psychedelics before. And, and the question is, how do you explain the unexplainable? Um, I, I, t I tend to start now with a question: Are you a parent? You know, do you have children, or or have you ever lost a loved one? And um, and the the reason I ask that is because these are two experiences that people humans can encounter that really do not, um, <laughs> they're not things that you can communicate the felt sense of with fidelity. You can use all kinds of words to try to describe these things. People have written books, poetry, based careers on trying to explain these human experiences, but you know, unless you've lost a close loved one or you know, given birth to a child, you, you really don't know uh, what these things, the, you know, the felt sense of that experience. And, and they're really good examples uh, to start a conversation with psychedelics about because uh, they're things that people can typically, if you're not a parent and you've never lost a loved one, you can still kind of get the sense that this is a big deal and this is something that humans can encounter. And it's probably not something that you can experience without being there. And, and I, I, I use that as an entry to describe that, you know, psychedelic experiences are similar. We can use all kinds of language to de try to describe what someone might encounter with a psychedelic experience, but none of it really does complete, um, uh, does, does justice to the experience. And, and, but we try our best. We say things like, you, know, you, you might experience the feeling like you're dying or dissolving or exploding or disintegrating. And well, what, the, what does that mean? I mean, putatively, none of us have died, right? And, and, <laughs> and I haven't died, at least you know, in the medical sense. And if someone describes their experience as, if, as having died, um, you know, of course, that's not what happened, but if you had to try to guess, you had to try to think of the experience of dying, that must be what it felt like. Um, this problem in communicating experiences is a problem that we have interpersonally as human beings for some experiences, but it's also a problem that science has in trying to explain the particular and unique phenomenon uh, of psychedelic experience and, and, and what exactly goes on. And we have all kinds of questionnaires and cognitive tests and tests of perception to try to tease apart tiny little pieces of this experience, but um, a lot of those things don't really do justice through, through the really unique and profound uh, states of consciousness that you, can, that you can encounter. And so I think that our group and, and a number of other groups have really glommed onto this notion of a mystical experience as an operational construct that describes and, 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 and in some way kind of can, can quantify what else is going on besides, you know, trails and, and you know, the room spinning and things like that. Um, Another problem is that you know, mystical experiences themselves aren't necessarily completely clear to people that don't understand what they mean, but I'll try to explain what we mean by that. Um, Alan Watts uh, is a pretty famous philosopher, and he, he wrote this about mystical experiences uh, a couple years before he died. Um, there are those particular, peculiar states of consciousness in which the individual discovers himself to be one continuous process with God or the universe or the, gra the ground of being or whatever name you may use uh, for ultimate and eternal reality. Um, this, is, this is an experience that's, that's actually undergone uh, lots of different types of study, uh, qualitative study. Um, William James, uh, in his 19, I think it's 1902 or 1904 book, Varieties of Religious Experience, um, devoted a chapter to mystical experience in which he began to kind of try to unpack the written experiences um, of some you know, religious figures and, and non-religious figures, and, and you know, say, Teresa of Avila and Rumi are two religious figures who are thought to have been mystics and encountered mystical experiences and trying to communicate mystical teachings. Um, but of course, these are experiences that aren't religious necessarily. They don't have to uh, occur in, in, in the context of a religious 
uh, tradition or a religious practice, uh, or even you know they can they can uh, occur with with uh, psychedelic uh, substances completely outside of the framework of of any religion or spiritual practice. Um, after William James, Walter Stace came through and in 1960 published a book on mystical experiences. In preparing for that book, he found all of the writing he could possibly find. Uh, on mystical experiences, you know, first-hand accounts and things like that, and, and, and really worked through it to try to come up with some qualitative analysis of what held together a mystical experience. And what he came up with and proposed was that there's a common core of, exper of dimensions to mystical experience, including the sense of unity, the self ceases, you're one with all that exists, there are no boundaries between self and other. Uh, the ex he proposed that the experience had an element of sacredness, of noetic quality, meaning that uh, it had some, some element to it that was more true than th other things that are true, you know, touching on the ultimate reality of, of existence. And um, it involved deeply felt positive mood, uh, ineffability or the inability to really communicate the, the experience with words, um, paradoxicality, holding two things that are disparate, such as, you know, I was completely lost but I knew exactly where I was. Um, transcendence of time and space, such that the normal boundaries of time and space didn't exist anymore. Um, he proposed this as a core of mystical experiences. Um, uh, Roland Griffiths started up uh, hallucinogen research, psychedelic research at Hopkins uh, in the early 2000s, and since he began our program of research, uh, we've administered over 700 uh, active psilocybin sessions to over 500 individuals um, and over the past 20 years. And, and in that corpus of work, every individual after every psilocybin session completed a questionnaire that tried to get at various aspects of what Stace was describing as mystical. And um, we've also administered questionnaires in the context of large internet surveys, a, a series of them, in which we've asked people to describe the experiences they've had with psychedelic drugs, typically only psilocybin, but more recently going into other psychedelics. And um, applying modern psychometric analytic techniques to these survey responses and also the, the data that we've collected in the lab, uh, we've determined, at least with the questions that we ask, um, we're not asking, did you have a mystical experience? We're asking, well, so tell me about how, how clear time was. Did time pass uh, normally? Uh, did space, you know, did you have the normal boundaries of space? Uh, were you, did you experience joy? Did you experience peace? You know, did you feel at one with the, your surroundings and things like this? And, and by, you know, averaging responses over these items and, 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 and trying to quantify these items, we can hopefully come to some even if it's imperfect or, or, or you know, that woefully imperfect, some, some number or some quantification of the degree to which what people were experiencing related to what Stace was talking about, right? And, and so analyzing our data, we've, we've figured out that from our questions, there are four dimensions of mystical experience that we can seem to reliably measure. And those are the experience of unity, the experience of deeply felt positive mood, loss of sense of time and space, and ineffability, and, and so, okay, so, so what, great. You have this questionnaire, you think you're measuring mystical experience. I have this other questionnaire, it's about cats. I really think it's cool, you should do that, and you know, you're gonna increase your love of cats after this experience. Well, this is where it gets interesting because uh, there are lots of questionnaires that we can throw at this experience, um, but mystical experience, the mystical experience questionnaire seems to have a really interesting property that um, at first, it's, it's, it's dose dependent, so the degree to which you endorse items in this questionnaire uh, increases with the degree of, uh, with the dose of psilocybin that you've been administered. But even more interestingly, um, in all of our studies, we follow people up typically one or two or four months after their psilocybin experience. And then we also, if we can, follow them up a year or more later. And I like to say, you know, this is after, you know, you've had this experience and that's great. Um, but then you've gone back to getting stuck in traffic and paying your taxes. And, you know, a year later, after life has come crashing down around you, what, what do you think of this experience? What, looking back on it, what did it mean to you? And, and even a year later, people are indicating uh, that um, it's, um, it's, I'm really sorry, this is impossible to read here, but <laughs> take my word for it. This is uh, a, a graph of ratings of uh, the uh, meaningfulness of the experience. And... These two ratings up here, this is uh, people saying that it was among the top five most meaningful experiences in my life. And this here is indicating that the experience was the most meaningful experience of a person's life. So, you know, I, yeah, I had kids, I got married, um, I passed the bar, I, I got my medical license, whatever it is. But, you know, also I had that experience in East Baltimore and that was among the top five or the most meaningful. And, and this is this, the case if you ask about meaningfulness of the experience, the spiritual significance of the experience, um, positive change in well-being that you attribute to the experience, 
and uh, positive changes in behavior that you attribute to your experience. Essentially, in all of these dimensions, a year later, people are uh, ascribing positive responses to their psilocybin experience, and also, these responses seem to be associated with degree of mystical experience. So we ask, ask other questions during experimental um, sessions, such as, you know, just what was the drug strength? How strong was it? All, all else being equal, and that doesn't really correlate nearly as well as this measure of mystical experience. Um, getting to therapeutic effects, we recently published uh, a study of uh, patients who uh, had uh, anxiety and depression secondary to a late stage cancer diagnosis, and NYU published uh, similar results. We found that the degree to which a person experienced, had a mystical experience, correlated nicely with um, the, the, the rating of personal meaningfulness of the experience, as well as uh, the spiritual significance of the experience. But more importantly for this sample, um, uh, degree of mystical experience correlated with degree of reduction of depression and anxiety scores um, after the experience. Um, and, and finally, uh, another investigator in our lab, Matt Johnson, uh, published a, 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 an open-label pilot study where he studied people um, with, uh, with uh, tobacco use disorder, smoking uh, addiction, and, and they showed that um, degree of mystical experience correlated with reduction in craving after psilocybin intervention for smoking. So uh, we're seeing, essentially, not only is this mystical experience uh, construct related to the strength of, of uh, you know, correlated with, with the, the dose level, not only is it correlated with the way that healthy people attribute the experience and their changes, but it also seems to possibly predict the therapeutic outcomes in both addiction and mood disorders uh, that, that are being investigated right now. So uh, we're following up now with a, with a study in, in uh, major depressive disorder, patients with major depressive disorder, and Matt's um, completing a study, in, uh, a blinded controlled study in, in uh, tobacco use disorder. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a minute. Um, uh, we, we, we have uh, some other interests besides, in our lab besides um, addictions and mood disorders and, and, and therapeutic uses. Um, there seems to be a really interesting relationship between meditation and psychedelics uh, that, that I'd like to bring your attention to if you're not already aware of it um, and, and, and use that as an intro to, to some data that I want to show you. Um, essentially, uh, there seem to be uh, the possibility for uh, a number of similarities between places that you can reach with meditation and places that you uh, can reach with psychedelics. Um, this is kind of borne out in the history of uh, American Buddhism. There are a number of leaders in the American Buddhist community who are very open and forward about their uh, experiences with psychedelics in the 60s uh, and, and the relationship of those experiences to development and, and establishment of their Buddhist practice. Um, some of the subject subjective effects of meditation that seem to be similar to the subject potential subjective effects of psychedelics include um, uh, giving one access to an authoritative sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things, which I'd like to bring attention, relates to the experience of mystical unity, um, increase, uh, giving someone the opportunity to increase compassion and loving kindness, which may relate to deeply felt positive mood within mystical experience, um, it, allowing one the opportunity to explore subtle levels of awareness and uh, possibly increasing the value of the present moment. Um, and and, and I, we can't ignore just the, the the outward uh, ablation of a sense of self. So uh, the, the goal of many meditative practices is essentially through various co conscious experimentation, um, demonstrate to the individual meditating that the self doesn't exist. It's a construct, it can be a very useful construct, but, but the idea is not to be a slave to that construct. And if, if psychedelics can't open you to that possibility, then I don't know what will. Um, <laughs> there, <laughs> So there's this, there's this, there's this unique history uh, that underlies potential synergy between these things. There's, there's a, a, certainly a, a, a number of dimensions of subjective effects that, that seem to be shared between these, but there's also a, an intriguing yet uh, maybe um, simple story uh, in, in the potential neural correlates of both meditative and psychedelic experiences. So um, in 2011, uh, Dr. Judson Brewer at Yale uh, published a study demonstrating that uh, during successful meditation in people with a long-term meditation uh, practice, uh, what he observed was decrease in activity of uh, two brain regions in particular. Uh, here is the posterior cingulate cortex and then the medial prefrontal cortex. And the posterior cingulate cortex is a brain region that's involved in self-referential processing. It's, it, it's involved in a lot of things, but, but it's, it's been shown to be uh, recruited for uh, making decisions such as, does this adjective describe me, or is that face mine or somebody else's face? And, and it's a, 
P, the posterior cingulate is an important hub in the brain, but it's, it's, it's certainly involved in uh, these self-referential processes. And the medial prefrontal cortex is involved in various processes such as autobiographical memory, theory of mind, trying to find, form a theory of your own mind or a theory of someone else's mind. What are they thinking when I speak to them? Um, these form the medial nodes of what's called the default mode network. And um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a really intriguing story to, to, to recognize that while meditative practices are meant to decrease a sense of self or kind of ablate the self, also when these practices are successfully conducted, uh, the areas of the brain that may be candidates for, for self-referential processing also decrease in activity. And more intriguingly, um, about just, just a year later, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris in Imperial College London published the first ever fMRI study uh, uh, of the acute effects of psilocybin and showed essentially the same brain regions showed decreased activity um, and, and uh, as, as showed decreased activity during meditation, uh, meditation and psilocybin. So um, it's, it's just a really simple comparison, but it really begs the question of whether there's, there's some relationship between both of these uh, pathways decreasing the sense of self and, and having shared neural correlates that, that are consistent with, with that kind of experience. Um, Robin's group went on to demonstrate that actually decrease in activity using a separate measure from fMRI, a measure called magnetoencephalography, um, decrease in activity of that region uh, also correlated with ego disintegration, which isn't the same thing as mystical experience, but I believe they're certainly related. And then a separate group altogether with, this, with a, yet a third brain imaging modality, electroencephalography, demonstrated, uh, Comiter, Michael Comiter and Franz Vollenweider demonstrated that decreased uh, uh, power and activity within this posterior cingulate cortex correlated with a measure of spiritual experience that they used. So just to kind of bring it all back, um, psilocybin and meditation may have a shared phenomenology. They may have shared neural correlates. Um, it, uh, just a basic science question would be, wow, this is fascinating. If, if you have on one hand like a pharmacological invention, intervention that brings you to this state of consciousness, on the other hand, a non-pharmacological in intervention that brings you to the same state of consciousness, the, the, the opportunities explode in terms of triangulating using different methods to try to understand, well, what's the biological basis of this experience to begin with? What's the biological basis of the sense of self, of consciousness, maybe? Um, you can then go and ask other questions such as, well, okay, if, if mindfulness and, and other meditative interventions are, are being proposed uh, as interventions for anxiety or mood disorders or other things, uh, well, and, and that's very difficult. Meditation is a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult practice to undertake and in a similar way that many people can't engage or completely follow through on talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, those therapies can often be uh, vastly more effective than some pharmacotherapy in treating disorders. It's just it's very difficult to do and not everybody can do it. And the same is with meditation. It's not a, it's not a, a, a golden bullet. You know, you have to engage in it and it's difficult. So if if these things aren't successful, but psilocybin and meditation both uh, work on similar underlying neural uh, systems, maybe psilocybin could be a second or a third line intervention, or maybe the first line intervention. That's yet to be seen. But um, before we answer any of those questions, we wanted to ask a really basic question. Is any of this true? So if we take a person with a long-term established meditation practice, we give them psilocybin, we ask them, so what happened? How was it? Was it, was it any, anything like what you've encountered in your meditative practice? They could say, oh yes, it was completely linear with what I've experienced before. It was a familiar place. I know this place. They could say, oh, you know, we're very similar. I could see how you can mistake them, but under, you know, under scrutiny, it's not quite the same. Uh, they're dissimilar, but they're complementary. Or why the hell did you do this to me? Um, we want it, it, before we answer any of those other questions, that's a, a reasonable first question to ask, right? So uh, we conducted a study uh, that was a two-part stu two experiment where in the, in the first part of the study, we uh, administered a, a, a large dose of psilocybin, 25 milligrams per 70 kilograms, to 40 individuals. These individuals had an average lifetime uh, meditation hour record of uh, about 5,000, over 5,500 hours, and that is roughly equivalent to a person meditating an hour a day every single day for about 15 years. So these are very experienced individuals. Uh, they all had at least one week long or many weekend retreats. And of course, if you're on a week long or a month long or a multi-month long retreat and you're meditating 11 hours a day, those hours really start to accumulate. So not everybody had certainly um, you know, 15 years of meditation under their belt, but some had far more than that. Um, in this first study, people meditated during their psilocybin experience, and then we did it, uh, brain imaging with fMRI before and after that experience. I'm not going to talk about that study yet. What I will talk about is the follow, the second study in that, uh, that series, we invited half of those individuals back and administered first a placebo and then uh, a, a moderate dose of psilocybin, 10 milligrams, and um, we, we uh, measured 
uh, brain activity using fMRI uh, while people meditated with placebo and then while people meditated with psilocybin. Um, people conducted three meditations. They conducted a focused awareness practice, which is essentially uh, mindfulness of breath. You take uh, a conscious percept related to breathing, uh, and you focus on that percept to the exclusion of all other objects of consciousness. That's focused awareness practice. We asked people to then, after that, do metta or loving kindness practice, which is a, a bit more of a structured practice where it, it comes in many forms, but essentially you wish yourself well and love and peace and safety, and then people close to you, uh, you wish them those things, and then people a little further from you, acquaintances who you may not know well, people who you know exist but you don't know them, and then maybe difficult people in your life. Uh, and the, the point of this practice is to generate a really strong felt sense of love and kindness for all things and, and, and beings. And um, after Metta Loving Kindness, we asked people to complete an open awareness practice, which is essentially the antipode of focused awareness, whereas in focused awareness you have one object of conscious that you maintain to, to the exclusion of all others. With open awareness, you, um, you, you let all sense doors be open. Anything that arises in consciousness, uh, you attend to that and you acknowledge that, but then you move on, you don't become attached, and you just observe everything as, as it arises in consciousness. So people were doing each of these meditations in the scanner under the effects of placebo and then under the effects of psilocybin. And after each meditation, we asked people a series of questions to kind of get an idea of the quality of the meditation. Um, and so just looking at effects of uh, psilocybin, regardless of what meditation was, was being conducted, um, we saw uh, modest increases in, in emotional reactivity, uh, during psilocybin and meditation compared to placebo and meditation, we saw a great increase in equanimity with the introduction of psilocybin. And equanimity is, it, is uh, calmness and stability uh, in the face potentially of chaos. And, and um, uh, a decrease with psilocybin in the mental effort required to, 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 to perform uh, the meditations. An increase in stability and a very uh, large increase in, in vividness of meditations. If we then break down meditation by psilocybin interactions, so for the question of positive emotion, um, there, uh, there was an increase in positive emotion experienced during focused awareness practice with psilocybin, but then there was a much larger increase with metta loving kindness, which is consistent with metta and loving kindness if you're doing it successfully, and that may have, <clears throat> that may have carried over to open awareness. Um, if we look at effects on equanimity, people really didn't show an increase in equanimity uh, during the effects of psilocybin during focused awareness practice, but they showed that increase with metta, which may have then carried over to open awareness. And uh, somewhat similar, to, well, and, uh, vividness was increased with focused awareness and increased with open awareness, but increased to a larger degree with metta and loving kindness. Um, another set of questions we asked people were, uh, how distracted were they were. So if, if you've ever had an MRI, um, I describe an MRI of the head, a brain MRI, as imagine putting your head in a small wastebasket and then sliding your, your body into a larger wastebasket and then having people beat on that with sticks. That's kind of what it's like. And you can imagine then how, how difficult that may be to be in that environment meditating and then be in that environment meditating with psilocybin on board, right? <laughs> so that's a challenge. Uh, we asked a number of different questions uh, about distraction and, and intriguingly, Psilocybin did not increase uh, distraction by sound in the focused awareness practice. It didn't, it, it seems to, but it didn't statistically significantly decrease distraction by sound in metta loving kindness, but it actually, with, with psilocybin on board, people were less distracted by sounds in open awareness, and I'm interpreting that as uh, a facilitation of uh, allowing the sound to be one more object of consciousness that you acknowledge and then let fall into the background. And um, another one was being distracted by thoughts. No difference with psilocybin for focused awareness, but uh, a decrease in distraction by thoughts for meta and, and open awareness. Um, and uh, not to keep this too long, I have, this is a busy slide, there's a lot going on here, uh, but uh, what we, and, and, and I told you a lot initially about the, the involvement of the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate as nodes of the default mode network and, and their importance in meditation and, and, psilis, uh, and, and psilocybin. Um, the, a more important story came out of the connectivity of two what we call the lateral nodes of the default mode network, whereas the posterior cingulate involves self-referential processing and maybe the medial prefrontal cortex involves autobiographical memory and theory of mind. The angular gyrus, these lateral nodes of the default mode network are, are more involved in orienting the self in space and time. Um, and so during focused awareness, we see essentially um, psilocybin increasing the gain 
of, this, of the communication between these lateral default mode network nodes and brain regions involved in the salience and interoceptive network. Well, what does that mean? So there's, there's a network of brain regions that are involved in, in, in attributing salience to things that you're attending to. And that, the connectivity of that brain region to space and time increased. And, and the interoceptive network is a, brain a network of brain regions that are involved in attending to internal stimuli, the internal milieu of your body. And so what is focused awareness practice mindfulness of breath than some form of, uh, uh, of, of interoceptive practice. So essentially, psilocybin is increasing the gain to visual interoceptive and salience networks to the default mode network, and also further decreasing connectivity between these lateral default network nodes and things like the posterior cingulate and the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, that's during focused awareness. Interestingly, during loving kindness meditation, we see an increase in connectivity between the posterior cingulate and the ventral striatum, which is involved in reward processing and implicated in things like, like pleasure and, and love, but not that's, those are you know, slightly more interpretive. Uh, but it, suffice to say, psilocybin seems to increase the gain between the self-processing systems and the reward processing systems. And, and these are all the brain imaging data. I hope, it wasn't, uh, I hope, hope that was interpretable. Um, I wanted to end with, with uh, answering the first question about meditation that, that we posed, which was, what is this? Is, is, there, any, is there any synergy? And, and, the vast majority of individuals who have completed this study have said some form of yes. Uh, some form of, th there were, there were, uh, the psilocybin experience was familiar. Uh, some people said it felt like home here. Some uh, specific testimonials. Uh, it was like a taste of the third noble truth. It is possible to end suffering. Suffering has an end. It is not home. It is not where I belong. I felt at home, at peace, where I belong. It was truly amazing. This individual is very interesting because he's a meditation teacher. Um, he taught beginning meditation classes for, for, for years, and, and he had 2,200 hours, lifetime hours of meditation. That's roughly equivalent to meditating once a day every day for six years. And he, he told me afterwards, he said, you know, I always taught my students that there was a place that existed without suffering, but this is the first time I actually know that to be true, um, which is, um, yeah, I'll let that speak for itself. Um, uh, another person with roughly the average uh, lifetime hours of meditation said, pure body and pure awareness, all and everywhere, nowhere. That was the best one-line description they could give of their experience. Another person with uh, the equivalent of meditating once a year every year for 32 years um, said, I replayed all of the peak experiences I had ever had while meditating. Um, and, and I'll just uh, end with this. This is a growing awareness of the lack of separation between self and other. I feel a total lack of duality. No good or bad, yesterday, today, sorrow or joy. The experience is of the unity of all things and the complete incompetence of language. I'm aware that language actually keeps us in a state of suffering or separation by naming things like life and death. It seems like these dualities are fictions. Um, I think that, uh, by and large, there's a lot of really interesting and fertile ground here to study in terms of the intersection between meditation and psychedelics, and I hope I've, I've communicated some of that to you. Um, just a, a shout out to the things we have going on now. We have a, a, a blinded controlled study for smoking cessation. We have a blinded controlled study for major depressive disorder, for people with major depressive disorder. Uh, uh, we're we're uh, part of a multi-site trial with NYU uh, for religious leaders, and, and we have the first study ever funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse to simply uh, study a hallucinogen in and of itself for its own sake. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention. And, uh, <laughs> We have time for one question. Anyone have one burning great question? Uh, someone closer? <laughs> In your... I really appreciate this is a lot of information that I'm uh, processing right now, but I was wondering, at what point in time do you think some of this, I know there's always a lag between science and actual implementation, what, what do you think the timeline could be, given that uh, you know, something like cannabis is changing so quickly? Right, um, that's, that's a great question. So what's the timeline uh, to, to making this drug, drugs like more widely available? Um, there's, there's currently, uh, there are currently talks uh, with um, a, a sponsor organization uh, to conduct phase three clinical trials with uh, psilocybin for the indication of major depressive disorder. 
and uh, those talks are ongoing. Uh, uh, there are a number of sites across the country that are going to be involved, and um, the, the timeline keeps changing. If you, have, if you know Hofstetter's Law, it takes twice as long to do anything you plan to do even when we counted for Hofstetter's Law, right? So, um, <laughs> the, uh, as I'm sure you know, these are complicated things and, and, and a bit messy but, um, to, to organize, but uh, they are coming, and, and I, I would bet that the phase three clinical trials uh, certainly may start up within the next year or two um, if everything goes well, um, though don't quote me, because um, I'm not directly involved in those uh, decisions, but um, once that trial is over, uh, if, if the if the indication is supported, if, if the results are positive, then the FDA uh, will hopefully, uh, if, if they you know if they keep up their end of the bargain, um, uh, basically approve psilocybin at least in some provisional way for indication. So if, if the time course of MDMA is, is any indication, uh, we're, we might be on a similar time course. Um, but uh, it's not inconceivable that within the next decade, psilocybin may be available. Um, for, for clinical use. Yep. Thank you very much.